So welcome to uh, the latest uh, podcast from the ICMTA, What Moves You? I'd like to introduce you to my friend, Deborah Bacon-Diltz, who I've known for 25 years, when we first met on the Five Rhythms Teachers Training, led by Gabrielle, in 1997. And I've known and worked with Deborah for these last 25 years and witnessed her transformation over those years and have always treasured her as a very, very wise person around the work that we do. And uh, I'm very pleased to do this conversation with her. Thank you. I would like to introduce my good friend, Peter Wilberforce. Um, and as Peter said, we've known each other since we met um, on the training exactly 25 years ago. Yeah, um, a quarter of a century. And um, I can still remember Peter in New York in his flowing red velvet dress, giving us a, um, a, a teacher, uh, uh, whatever we had to do when we were doing the training to teach a class on lyrical. And that marked me forever. And um, <laughs> Peter has evolved uh, in many ways. One of the things I've always appreciated about you is the creativity that you bring oh, to your you. work. Yeah. Yeah, so we're speaking to you from my home in France. Um, Peter came from the UK to France uh, several years ago now and has been teaching in France. I started teaching in France thanks to Deborah, who invited me here in 2001. And then uh, that developed and finally I moved to France in 2009. So I've been living in France since 2009. So those 25 years have been incredibly rich um, journeying with this role of teaching movement work, teaching specifically the five rhythms, but um, standing up there on those dance floors, um, learning, 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 creating, creating, creating. And I'd love to hear you talk about where you are now, because I know you've evolved your work to include the voice beyond staying with just the format of the five rhythms. So. So I think uh, the key thing for me was spending many years uh, teaching the five rhythms and that being my only frame of reference. And then realizing that alongside uh, the teaching, I was developing other interests or becoming more aware of how other aspects of my my working personal life interacted with the five rhythms. So one of those things was uh, working with voice. I was teaching in a conservatory in London. I was teaching movement and theater to singing students in, in a conservatory in London. And I realized that I was using the five rhythms as a physical warm up for the singers. Uh, and I suddenly one day went, well, how would it be if with the five rhythms dancers, I introduced the singing? Because what I witnessed with uh, the loosening the body, freeing the body, giving the possibility for these singers, who are often very obsessed about getting it right, mm -hmm. uh, the opportunity just to be completely in their bodies and their bodies to be mobile, the effect on their voices was extraordinary is that when they stopped worrying and were just in the movement of singing then their voices were like flowers that blossom mm. and then alongside that over the years i developed a deeper and deeper feldenkrais practice mm -hmm. the feldenkrais method um which has, is is almost the opposite to five rhythms, which is it's tiny, almost invisible movements, mm -hmm. but focusing mm -hmm. on the detail and how if I give my attention to the detail of my movement slowly enough and with enough attention, I can start to feel how that little movement has an effect through the whole of my body. Mm -hmm. And that has an extraordinary effect in liberating 
the body without having to look for liberation. Mm -hmm. And so now um, most of our work is based around using the idea that if the body is free and mobile, then my creative energy is free mm -hmm. to express mm -hmm. and, uh, and particularly using the voice. There's so much uh, to reflect on with all of these years of being with groups and, and showing up in, yes. in this context yeah. of inviting people into, into their own experience, because whether it's the five rhythms or I also trained in open four, um, or basically anything where, where we're creating a context in which people can connect more deeply to themselves and to each other through their bodies, there are so many different nuances going yes. on in what we're asking yes. people to do. Yes. And I look back, starting teaching back all those years ago, all the things that I didn't see and didn't know and, and look back on now and wish I did, but I'm happy to have learned. And I know when you and I talk, which fortunately we often do get to share about yes. this strange path of being a, yes. a conscious movement teacher, um, our conversations really help me to see more, more subtly and more clearly what I'm doing. And um, you mentioned Feldenkrais recently, and I just um, think maybe we could share a little bit about what we have found helps people to connect more deeply with their bodies. Yeah, um, yes. Because it's not just about gesticulating. No, that we we're not that. about what does it look like. And I think that's the thing, that's one of the things that I really didn't get at the beginning that um, it's not about what it looks like. It's not, it's not even about dancing. I do remember, and I say this so often in, in, in uh, workshops and classes, I remember Gabrielle sitting in front of us teaching and going, look, it's not about dancing. It's got nothing to do with dancing. And, and, and just remembering that helped me just to go, no, it's not. It's about what moves inside me and when I choose to express it, how does it express? And that also means that as I'm accompanying dancers, I can very happily say to them and, very, and feel that it's actually often really important just to say, it doesn't matter what comes out. I don't mm -hmm. give a fuck. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what comes out. What is moving inside you and how, therefore, might that express in movement mm -hmm. in the space? Mm -hmm. um, I think when we talk about um, how to really invite people to connect to their bodies, one of the other things that I feel most clearly about is, is that the tempo, the time we take to connect, mm -hmm. the coming home, mm -hmm. uh, that we can't know what will, what is, authentic when we move unless we're fully present to the body mm -hmm. and I think in that way it's just slowing down mm -hmm. it's giving myself the time giving mm -hmm. the dancers the time to notice to not be in a hurry to be dancing absolutely you, you, I took your class the other night and mm. I really love that we started with a nice quiet time on the floor mm. coming in from rushing through the metro in Paris yeah. and arriving in the room. It was a blessing to just stop and just arrive and before starting to move. That worked yeah. for me that yeah. night, but that yeah, was yeah. That's one way of inviting. I just think what you just said is such an illustration of why does the practice of the five rhythms anyway begin in flowing? Yeah. You know, why do we breathe in first? It's this taking the time to actually arrive in that mm. whole universe of um, connecting, feeling, listening, sensing, and receiving what's here. And that's not something that most of us drop right into. There's yeah. a there's a there's a journey to arrive in that. And of course, the more you practice arriving in that, yeah. the more accessible it yeah. often yeah. is, yeah. but not always. It depends yeah. upon what else is going on. But if that time isn't taken or that 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 foundation isn't laid at the beginning, 
um, it's not necessarily easy to connect with what comes next, especially if we're going through a wave, which isn't always true. Some people end up dropping into themselves at the end of a class. So this yes. is, you know, we don't want to yes. have rules here, but that time to connect and listen so vital. But it's the, yes, it's the, for me, it's the invitation to slow down and notice. Mm -hmm. It's like, it, and you know, for each person, it will be different. But in a way, it's like, unless you, yeah, if I slow down, if I, if I take that time, even if it's uncomfortable, I think that's the deal, mm -hmm. is that sometimes, you know, you just said, you know, for some people, it doesn't arrive until the end of the way. That's perfectly possible. But actually, as a practice, we can also start to go, this is part of the practice. The practice is not just flowing staccato, chaos, lyrical mm -hmm. stillness. It's arriving what does arriving mean right how does coming down so that i at least have some basic connection with my matter mm -hmm. which is the tool that i'm going to use to explore that's so interesting because that's exactly how i understood and still understand the universe of flowing um when i when i tune into um that that phase of, mm. a, of the process of the wave, but of, mm. of basically any process that has a beginning and an mm. end, mm. it's that, that connecting with my matter. Yeah. And that matter is going to include more or less concrete sensations, mm. but also it's going to include just that whole sense of what's here, like you said, noticing yeah. what's here. And, yeah. and the, the super important quality of of allowing that to be there, yeah, yeah, yeah. of welcoming that to be, and as also, it is. and also to notice what's there, but not need to necessarily grasp it. No, like a sort of you know uh, a rubber ring in the middle of the ocean. It's actually uh -huh. what's there, what's moving in me already. Right, um, and, and and that's the other thing I think that over the years I've really, really, really learned, particularly in uh, accompanying dances. A, I'm, an I'm much more an accompanier, accompanier um, somebody who accompanies, mm -hmm. um, than a teacher. Mm -hmm. If I think about the vocabulary around mm -hmm. that, that we can use for our role, I think often teacher brings the idea of I'm giving instruction. Whereas actually if I accompany, my vision is that I'm holding space so that for the dancers the participants to make autonomous explorations mm -hmm. and my role is to offer ways in which they might be able to come more intimately in connection mm. to their bodies to what's going on for them right and that has made me and this is also for which i'm incredibly grateful uh is through feldenkrais is that how do we open that space to people and it's by using questions and the idea of inquiry mm -hmm. rather than you've got something that you have to do mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. so that any 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 movement is an exploration mm -hmm. it's not it's not a this is what it is mm -hmm. it's but oh what's happening what's happening that 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 i as the person accompanying creates a space where the dancer the participant is in inquiry in their own bodies, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in the space. So in, in a process of inquiry that you're inviting mm. them into, that's really interesting to hear, um, to think about defining what is my role mm. or what is my mm. function yeah. um, as I'm offering this space. I think sometimes I am a teacher yeah. because there's a teaching yeah, that yeah, comes yeah, yeah, yeah. through. Yes, absolutely. And then you know, we hear this phrase, we are teachings ourselves in the sense mm. that whatever it is that yeah. people are perceiving in us is also going to be something that informs their experience. Mm -hmm. um, but I also like the aspect of this work, which is to know that we can also in, invite or even instruct to experiment a certain structure, um, experiment with a certain structure in order to um, enter into a certain territory. Yeah. And that's something that I remember Gabrielle 
one of the things she loved to say about herself was that I know exactly what I'm doing. Sometimes I think she didn't know exactly what she was doing, but she knew she didn't know what she was doing. So she still knew what she was doing, but, but which is, um, you know, that famous phrase, you have the discipline necessary to be free, which is how it lives in me. That balance that I'm always looking for between inviting to explore with a certain structure because that structure will create experiences that you most likely won't visit without that yeah. structure so there's a balance that i'm yeah. i'm i'm always interested in between yeah. um that free whatever emerges be with it experience and if we do this, then, then that's going to orient our experience in a certain direction, but there's a reason for it. Yeah. It's not random, the yeah. things we might instruct yeah. or invite. So for me, there's a, there's a sort of a multi-function um, or many different um, directions that in any given class, my role might fulfill. Yeah, yeah. No, that's absolutely true. And I think I I suppose I have a, a certain attitude which is, and you already identified them, there's there's the moments of exploration where one might say they're the moments of learning or teaching. And then there's 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 the moment of just living, being. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that any 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 practice has uh has guidelines mm -hmm. even you know zen meditation the simplest guidelines you could possibly imagine but it still has its guidelines and then right. everything that happens within those guidelines is experience and learning right and, and but you always follow those guidelines you sit in 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 in, uh, in in the meditation and you have a certain posture and you have a certain way of breathing so as we both sharing around the five rhythms uh we have the map of the five rhythms, which as you reminded me many years ago and often about, the five rhythms is a map, it's not the thing itself. Mm -hmm. And how we use yeah. the map to follow and cross the landscape is the experience. Right. The map is our guide. Right. The map is, is, and everybody interprets the map, interprets the map in different ways and everybody chooses to travel across that terrain using using different pathways right. uh, and that's the nature of our individual our individual nature and movement uh so i think absolutely there are times when you need to go okay we need to look at this because this can help us evolve our voca expressive mm -hmm. vocabulary right and now that we've attended this very specifically which sometimes is really hard for mm -hmm. people because they don't want to go there mm -hmm. because it's uncomfortable mm -hmm. or it feels like it's a bit of waste of time or it's almost too obvious for mm -hmm. them but let's just go there look at it okay well, how does that change my movement what does that offer me uh in terms of choices mm -hmm. and then when i've done that very clear conscious study how does that shift my dance my exploration my journeying when it's just me moving just me being mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so yes i agree there are we have different roles different postures at different times mm -hmm. when we're holding a space mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah exactly yeah. Um, and then, of course, that is part of what's unpredictable in yeah. any given moment, because it's also about what and this is, I think, what you learn, what we learn once we start doing, holding these spaces, yeah. what might the moment need and yes. that we can't map out ahead of time. Yeah. But yeah. there are some I think what's coming to me are some. Um, underlying principles that I think no matter what it is that we're asking people to explore that have become really clear to me about mm -hmm. holding this kind of space mm -hmm. and um, one of them is to remember that I really don't know what anybody else is experiencing absolutely and that I want to hold um, an internal attitude that whatever their experience is it is it's okay and it's welcome. Um, yeah. And and to be careful in how I say things, um, 
not to suggest that something is preferable to something else. Mm -mm 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 -mm. No, I think back about some, when I think it's kind of embarrassing to think back about my first classes and my first workshops <laughs> when I was all full of myself. Yeah. Remember how Gabrielle would always say, get over yourself, yes. it's not about yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's taken yeah. about 25 years yeah. to actually feel like maybe that's finally happening, Determined. you know, to get yeah. out of the Me way too. of that insecurity that I'm not good yes. enough standing up yes. there. And so yeah. I need to maybe make everybody happy or make certain things happen so they feel good. Yeah. And all, all of those things have, yeah. You know, been so they were so um, obvious standing up there teaching. I had yeah. such a good look at yeah. all of those places where my relationship to myself was fragile, you know, scared, yeah. Yeah. Um, inadequate, insecure, all of those things. And I would say the dances helped tremendously, and the the, the teaching to um, to see and work with those things. Yeah. But I know I'm wandering a little bit, but I just want to say that I also have realized that the dance alone is not enough if there's to be um, change on certain levels, no, because there are absolutely. things we can absolutely avoid just yeah. by going and dancing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So. Absolutely. And just, that, just responding to that really quickly, that's something that to me in the last few years has become so key, is it's not just about moving the body. If we don't bring consciousness to what the movement is, where we are in the space, then um, we might as well go to a disco. Mm. Um, and that's not to say there isn't space for just dancing, letting go Absolutely. and, and the, 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 what good it does us to be in free movement. Um, for me in the last few years, that side has become less important than What's going on here? Mm -hmm. What's going on here? And as a teacher, that therefore means what's going on here in front of me? What's right. going on here? And just as you were saying, you know, we can't know what's going on for each person in the room. How many times have we had feedback at the end of a class from somebody who we were sure was wasn't doing anything and hated it? Yeah. And they come to you and they go, oh, that's fantastic. I've never yeah. moved so much in my life. Yeah. And I'm going, what? but you hardly moved at all. So each yeah. person's experience is their experience. The other thing for me, as you were talking about, that came to me is, and I don't know when a teaching will land in the body and heart of one of the people participating. Absolutely. That I can't, it might be now, it might be next year, it might be in three years time. And that all I can do as, a, as, a, as somebody holding the space is to offer mm -hmm. and if the dancer participant is ready to take it and move with it mm -hmm. then all all well and good if they're not at that place where they can hear it even and I know I've been one of those dancers who cannot hear what people are saying doesn't matter how many times they say it and I'm sure that if we compared notes on our training there'll be things that you will have heard loud and clear from Gabrielle that I never even heard. No, you know, and certainly. perhaps vice versa. Vice versa. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, uh, and, uh. So, and the other thing that in, in, in response to what you were saying is this idea of what do the, my relationship to myself as I'm, as I'm holding space and, and how much that is also practice is that Absolutely. actually what are the basics that I offer myself as a teacher when I'm holding the space what are the basics of my practice as a as a space holder a teacher and and I, and I think we've named a couple of them already we don't know what the experience of the person mm -hmm. is we don't know when the teaching is going to land mm -hmm. if ever and then I would just ask then I would just go go back to what I said earlier is um, what can I offer that allows them to explore autonomously? Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. only when they explore autonomously mm -hmm. will they fully own their experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can't make the experience for them. No, so course. if I'm too directive, and as you were saying, not to, to avoid this rather than you know instructions that say it should be rather this than mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. how do i language my accompaniment so it never makes it as though somebody has to choose between 
something, but actually their own experience is of value, whatever it mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. And in that way, the, and that whatever I offer them can be turned into active exploration and in within the practices that we offer it's movement in your case med sitting meditation mm -hmm. in my case sounding mm -hmm. so that then they mm -hmm. they they embody they and that, that for me embodiment turns meaning they own their learning that's right that's right so again that brings me back to this question of the the balance between um creating a container i've been talking to you a lot about safety recently mm, because i'm yes. plunged into the yes, study of the yeah. nervous system yeah, 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 and yeah, the absolutely. whole the polyvagal theory which i yeah. encourage everybody to become familiar <laughs> with but if because, you've got a phd because well, no actually it's become extremely accessible i'm just listening to the the creator of it who's a scientist but um it we we are as they say in French, the guarantee of the safety, the garant de la sécurité yeah, in the container right. when we're in that role. Yeah. Um, and learning is much more possible and accessible when we feel safe. Yes. And that, that feeling of safety yes. is, of course, a balance between, I keep doing this because yeah, it's, but... it's creating a container yeah. within which there's freedom. And again, we're always looking for that balance yeah, between yeah, the two yeah, absolutely. so that people can surrender to their own experience. Yeah, and, they, yeah. They, can, they can settle. They can it, settle in space rather than feeling they have anything to be vigilant about. Yeah. And, I, and, I think, and I think it's a matter of age and energy, but I can certainly remember 25, almost 30 years ago, when I discovered the practice of the five rhythms for the first time, um, there was something in the air, and maybe because the group was made up of younger people, about it being exciting to push the limits, mm -hmm. to see how far you could go, to see how sweaty your chaos could be, how fucking energetic you could be in your staccato, um, and, and how high you could jump when you're lyrical. And, <laughs> But actually what I realized is the first, one of the first classes I set up, I called Dancing on the Edge. Mm -hmm. And now 20 years later, I go, oh my God, in terms of learning, that feels like the very last thing I would want to offer anybody mm -hmm. now. Because if I'm on the edge, I have to give a lot of my energy to how do I stop falling over? Mm -hmm. How do I stay? Mm -hmm. On, mm -hmm. on the edge mm -hmm. um, so that it's, you know, I'm not free falling into oblivion. And, and, and actually that therefore means, and this is because I believe this is about how I learn and you've already named it, is I learn because things are going slowly enough and quietly enough for me to notice. Mm -hmm. And therefore in noticing I have choice. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. So how do I, but if half of my energy is, this is where I, you know, I, I, I have this gesture, you have this gesture, but this is maybe the thing that we're exploring is how do we make this safe container that allows people to be able to just go, oh yeah, okay, here I am. Okay, here I am. Oh, what's going on? Oh, what's going on? What's going on? Makes me think um, three questions I use constantly in class, which I got from one of my original Fulham Price teachers in London, Scott Clark. And he used these, these, these three questions. Where am I? Mm -hmm. Who's there? What's going on? Those are like the three questions, almost the same three questions that, that we explored in our training. Yeah. Do you remember? No, see, that's, that's <laughs> where, um, you have, where am I? Anyway, go ahead. So where so, am I? What, so who's who, there and what's going on? Where am I? Where am I in my body? And also where am I in the space? So mm -hmm. it's all about home and the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. At home in my body, in the world. Mm -hmm. Where am I in my body? Where am I in the world? Who's here? Who's here in my body? Who's here around me? Right. What's going on? What's going on in my body? What the fuck is going on around me? So those are such beautiful, fundamental, fertile questions exactly. for us exactly. all the time. Yeah. Really, because we live here. We're, yes. we're here in the world yeah. and we're here in the larger space. Yeah, so yeah, 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 yeah. 
So we could do it now, <laughs> you know, we we could, could, because it, yeah. actually where we are in this space. And I think that's what it also brings to me, brings me into focus when I use it for myself is this is not about just what's going on on the inside. I'm not an isolated um, neutron or whatever it is no, flying around in the right. world. That's right. My practice is about bringing myself into the world, but fully embodied in the world. That's right. So that's why I really like those questions because it makes me realize that as I am now, the ceiling of this room is part of my experience, mm -hmm. the table, mm -hmm. the plant, mm -hmm. you know, all of these things are part of my experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so the three questions, yes. maybe you'll remember this now. Um, we were put into three groups oh, yes. and the questions, the first group was the flowing group and the people who at Gabrielle said had mother wounds. Yes. You know? Um, but the question for the flowing group was, who am I yeah. and what do I need? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, the second group was the staccato group. Yeah. And those are the people who may have father wounds, and, yeah. you know, in quotes, which is, who are you? Yeah, yeah. And what do you need yeah. from me? Yeah. And the third group, which is the chaos group, is... What's going on <laughs> around here, and yes. where is my place in this yeah, bigger yeah, 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 group? Yeah, yeah. So it's yes. the it's maybe wounding about belonging or or connection yeah. to a collective. Yeah. So I mean, she put those as wounds, and that and those are the places that we yes. were probably going to be mm. working and healing. Mm. But mm. those three questions are fundamental. Absolutely, I think yeah. about um, as you mentioned, I I moved into meditation and yeah. I really I love the sitting meditation practice, the mindfulness meditation. Mm. Same questions. Yeah. I think these are the fundamental questions yeah. of existing as an embodied human being in relationship. And yeah. we are always in relationship, yeah. you know, with this internal yes. process here and then here and yeah. here, always. Yeah. Yes. And and as you said, if we're aware of it, then we have choice. Yes. So that's, I just find, whether it's the five rhythms, mindfulness, Feldenkrais, or so any of the practices yeah, yeah, that yeah. all of us teach, it's, those are fundamental questions that we're always working with. Yes. And that will lead us to more more presence, more connection, more engagement, more clarity, I mean, all these things that we hope that over a lifetime we cultivate and that the world so desperately needs yeah, from us. Yes, yes. You know? and I think in that, in that sense also, and we were talking about this the other day, um, we're always going to fall over. Yes. When we're sitting in meditation, the mind is always going to wander off. Exactly. You know, when we're moving, the mind will probably at some point go oh look at that dance of somebody else they move so much better than i do you know all these things are getting it wrong um and, and i think there's two things obviously accept that we're always going to get it wrong but which of course is not the case it's just part of the process that's just a, a part of the ego speaking. exactly exactly yeah. but therefore how and you mentioned this earlier how we as teachers space holders create the environment whereby it's not about getting it right or wrong exactly it's not possible to fail and it's always just about exploring and meeting yes and opening opening wide to a bigger field that's almost what it feels like to me can we open wider to a bigger field of consciousness and possibility so we have a bigger bigger range of choice in our being and our way of doing so i what you just said brings me on a slightly different tack but i think really important given that who we are addressing here mm. is um a group of teachers yes. teachers in training yeah. um new teachers more experienced teachers but what you just said about creating a an, an atmosphere creating a container creating a space where really you can't get it wrong yeah. requires on the part of the, the teacher mm. 
not being attached to whether they do what you ask or not. And I want to bring that up because that's a big <laughs> part of, of what certainly has taught me over all of these years. Um, I, I saw how much I took it personally if I made an invitation yeah. and people did something else yes. or didn't do it. Or, you know, that could just bring up ego storms yeah, yeah, inside of yeah, me. Yeah. And so to truly create a safe container means doing that internal work to really be yeah, okay yeah. with people having the freedom to have their own experience and yet also having the the um you know standing up in also sometimes um redirecting somebody yeah. uh, or making uh, you know i know i don't know if you remember he, what I remember very clearly in our training was to learn to give an instruction to the whole group when you're actually talking to one yes, person. Yes. Um, but to also know that sometimes it serves to help people to break out of their unconscious automatic inertia, yeah, same uh, thing over yeah, and over again, yes. by inviting them into something that you are asking them to do. So yes. there's also there another fine yeah. line to toe that I find yeah. really interesting. Yeah. I think we should probably think about wrapping up. It's probably, I think it's going to be soon about. Oh my God. About long enough for you all to sit there and listen but to us. I wanted to, I wanted to add before we finished, because you were talking about um, relationship to participant. For me as a space holder, there's also the relationship to my intentions. You know, when I start a class or a workshop, is I often set myself a course. This is what I would like to explore. If I do this, I could probably imagine that this will happen and therefore it will evolve in this way. And I've recently noticed to, uh, to which point I need to, once I've set course, it's like being on the ocean. Mm -hmm. The winds are actually going to oblige me to probably navigate my course, not quite as direct as I thought right. I was going to. So right. therefore, how as a process of accompaniment, I can, even as I try to plot my course, I can also let go of my expectations. Mm -hmm. So just as I would invite dancers, participants to have no expectations of what might express either when they're moving or when they're singing, what can I do as a, an, a, a space holder teacher to give that space for the unexpected to arise in the room and then follow and accompany what's happening? And that, Peter, I think is maybe easier for some types of personalities than others. Mm. And I think it's something that is acquired over time. Yeah. That... Um, preparing and then letting go of what's prepared and then showing up mm, to what's mm, actually happening mm, in the moment mm. is a skill and an art. And it's also to remember that within the context of what we're offering people, there's no right and there's no wrong. There's better and there's worse, one might say, in terms of experience. But, you know, there's no piece of music that is wrong mm -hmm. because in the end, if we're offering a space which is open to create autonomous exploration, it's always about how the dancer participant responds to what the instruction mm -hmm. is, what the music mm -hmm. is. And if suddenly I put a piece in the middle of flow that's really not flowing, what happens to the person? How do they how do they move with what is rather than what they think should be? But you would do that intentionally. Not necessarily. Uh-huh. It might happen because I've listened to this piece that at home sounded really, really flowing. But then on this sound system that I'm working with, which I've never used before, in this room, which I've never worked in before, the acoustic is different, the sound system, and suddenly all I hear is the beat underneath. Is it right, right. And so right. suddenly it's going, oh, oh this doesn't work. But Rather than going, oh my God, it's wrong. Right. Is there is there space to go, oh, actually, how are people responding? What comes up for them when what we expect is and, not delivered? And in that in that moment, because I've certainly had moments like that, many <laughs> moments us, like that, us. lots of moments like that. The the ability to um 
let it be okay within ourselves that it yeah. didn't fit our plan yes. and it isn't necessarily graceful or, or, or harmonious yes. and not intentional um yes. and how to how to stay connected yeah. to yourself yeah. to them and yeah. to the process in yeah. these moments of surprise and um and to be able to be okay with some people not being okay with that. Yes. You know, and that, so there's, as I said, there's so many levels of this that we could and, explore. And at the base, somebody not being okay with that has a dance. If we can help them to yes, find the dance that they need that help, yeah. because truly, and I think I'll end on this note for myself, what made me fall in love with the this practice and actually before the rhythms there were other practices yeah. that um that did this for me i was dancing already um but with with the five rhythms this became so very explicit for me there is nothing that can't be included yeah there is yeah. nothing that yeah. can't yes. be included yes. Yes. and danced yes. or moved with yeah. Yeah. the the biggest resistance the biggest pout fest, yeah. the biggest, the, the biggest anger, the biggest sadness, the biggest uh, boredom. Yeah, it all can be danced, That's and the so, so everything is included. Yeah. And to me, that is probably the pearl that has become yeah. more and more precious yeah, yeah. as my yes. life has gone yes. on. Is the learning to truly be inclusive of all of my experience? Absolutely, is that. Yes, totally. And, and I think when we arrive in that place, which every now and again we do, there is a joy which is just about being vitally alive. You know, it's the joie de vivre. Uh, and, and, I, and, and it is, so actually, how does your boredom move? How does your anger move? How does your, fuck this teacher, he's talking too much, move? Right. All this stuff. And suddenly when you are good, so... So it's actually finding the joy of being alive. Yeah, really. I think that's a beautiful note to end on because <laughs> we could go on and on, which we do when we get together and speak. And um, there's so much to share. Um, yeah. I just would like to maybe end by encouraging conversations like this with colleagues. Um, just sit and reflect on what are we learning? Yes. What have we learned? What's yeah. happening inside of me as I explore this um, path of being a teacher and take yeah. it out of the frame of getting it right as we've been talking about or being oh, good yeah. enough and, and exploring those feelings too. Just there's nothing that isn't okay to be part of our experience. So let's include it. And uh, yes. in, in relationship, then I don't know, there's so many times when I've shared something with you that I've been struggling with and because you receive it, yeah and you and you hear me and and you help me to explore it it's yeah. it has um just sort of it's moved yeah and then it's yeah. not stuck and it can evolve so yeah, yeah yeah it's interesting what you just said it just makes me think you know how often do we say to uh dancers participants you know um allow yourself just to be exactly as you are and we want them to feel free and how often through my teaching life um i haven't given myself that permission as a teacher to you know there's no rules there's no steps to learn how often have i said this to new <laughs> people who arrive and yet when it comes to teaching i feel like there's you know there's rules to follow and i need to do it this way and they need to get it right and actually who I am and my relationship to being in movement and being present in movement, then I can allow my creativity through if I just want to invite people to explore that possibility for themselves. So it's always, there's always going to be this, um, this constant dialectic yeah. between our own inner processes and our relationship yeah. to ourselves and how that shows yeah. up in, yeah. in what it is that yeah. we're inviting other people yeah. to. Yeah, the explore. teaching becomes conversation. Yeah. I think it intrinsically is, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And then yeah. We, we learn yeah. to listen. So 
Anyway. Cool. That sounds that like we've fun. just started. I, yeah, exactly. <laughs> we've just like, landed. That was our like, warm-up. We didn't know well, we should have warmed up before we started. <laughs> so. Yeah. Well, if you're still here at the end, thank you. <laughs> thank you for listening. And yeah, really. Some of these reflections have maybe sparked some some reflection in you, or or maybe you don't agree and have some other way to think about it. Talk to someone about it. Yeah. Um, and blessings to all of us, every one of us, for um, yeah. showing up and providing these spaces that are true healing spaces for our 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 species right now. Very very valuable and mm-hmm. precious. So yeah. great encouragement mm-hmm. to everyone. Take good care.